All right, let's start with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 We thank you, Heavenly Father, for this time to talk to you and to speak about, uh, talk together about morality and truth. Help us to learn that we stand with you through temperance and play the practice in our lives. We entrust this time this conversation to you through our mother as we say. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy Lord Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and in the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's a wrong paragraph, 14. <laughs> <laughs> and just to uh, look back and a little bit before we go forward, because some of us were here. John Paul II wrote this about 30 years ago, 1993, um, as a response to certain trends in, in thought about morality. A couple of different challenges he was facing to kind of the current culture of how we away today. This is a very relevant thing to read. Um, and one of the things that people were starting to say or trying to claim under John Paul II's time was they were saying that morality, doing the, the one that was right and wrong, doing the right thing, knowing how to live the right way, is not an objective thing that you don't know what to do, do it always. They would say the chain was right and wrong, good and bad, you know, the circumstances. That means that there might be times where murder is good, where bad thing your spouse is good, where fill the blank is good, okay? They try to reduce morality simply to the rules that's abstracted from truth, abstracted from love, abstracted from anything in the gospel. And from there they would say we also live as a place in society that, that we believe many different things. So if people are Jewish or Hindu or Buddhist or how can we as Catholics claim we have the answers? How can we as Catholics that we have the truth when it comes to what is good and bad? And what this means, therefore, is that what they were trying to say is that, that we can't speak to the Holy Good Rights. We can speak and say what's, what's good for Catholics, but they would say we can't speak what's good for everyone. And so there was the separation then of right and wrong, good and bad, from truth, from a universal system. They would just say, really, all we can do is kind of talk about what's good and bad. And very often they would try to, to equate ignoring the law with love. And there, there was a kind of buzzword that was going around called, say, we're being pastoral. We're, we're, we're doing the right thing in pastoral. Yes, in most situations, you can't leave your spouse. I'm going to be passed from telling you in this case you can because, well, life's really hard with your husband or whatever it might be. So I'm going to be passed and I'm going to help you out this way and say it's okay in your situation. We're going to figure out a way where if you commit adultery, we're safe on adultery. So John Paul II was trying to answer these questions and say, how can we speak? What do we really mean to say morality? So he's trying to root it back at something that's objective, something, something that is not simply for one particular person or place or time, but applies to all peoples, all places, all ways. And the first thing he does then is he begins to say, what is more, what is right and wrong? What does what is right and wrong? He says it goes back to, first of all, the way God made us. And since God is the source of all human lives, and what is good and bad for human beings is going to be the same. Because we're all the same creator. We're all the same origin. We're all human beings. And so there is, first of all, a right and wrong based upon our nature, based upon the fact that we're human beings. But everybody knows murder is wrong. Everybody knows that, that cheating on your spouse is wrong. Everybody knows these things that are being told them. It's going to go deep down in our hearts, written in our hearts, part of our creation. We want to say, more than that, because Christ is God, because our goal then is to be with God forever, morality is not simply following the rules. Morality is the search for God and coming to know Him. 
Doing the right thing is to walk with God. Doing the right thing is to live in such a way that our attitudes, our behavior, our actions, our choices reflect God's life, reflect who God is, and lead us to make us like Him. And therefore, as Catholics, because we are all in Christ, who is, who is the leader, the creator, and the ruler of all, we can say that there is one truth for all people. And so in the same way we can't be afraid to say there's one, there's one faith, there's one God, we have to be able to say there is one morality. And therefore we can speak about right and wrong, apply to all people, not to be afraid to say, oh, I can't speak to anybody, this is my opinion, this is what I feel, what I think. You can have your own morality. Everything has to lead us toward Christ and walking with Christ and following Christ. And so we begin this reflection on the story of the rich young man. We begin talking about some of these things. It begins by showing that at the end we have in the scriptures it says kind of three sources, these three uh, places where God teaches us, shows us how to do the right thing, how to walk, how to walk. Because morality is a fancy term. It all means it is, is doing the right thing. It's all it means. Moral theology just means how do I follow Christ? How do I do the right thing? And do so in the context of all of Christ. It's big fancy words, but it's, a, it's not that big a deal if you know what it's being said. And so it's this question of rich young man, uh, where, where it is what John II is pulling apart. He's beginning by saying, in the end, we, we, our goal is God, our goal is heaven, and following him. We went to one paragraph 14 right now. And so in this discussion of the second has gone through and shown how, sorry, so we have three sources. So there's the uh, natural law, this is the great our creation, the Old Testament law, Ten Commandments especially, where God reveals to us when He broke our hearts. The New Testament, which through Christ then completes that and affects that, because now we have God Himself who walks with us and makes this possible. It's now we know how to do the right thing, which is not just following it. Set of rules to Christ, us walking alongside of Christ and doing what Christ did. And so now, now it's, we have a more complete way to live as God lives. And so we look at the discussion of following God in the first three commandments. And now, continuing on this meditation on the story of the rich young man, we're trying to see his ask teacher what to do to live eternal life. But I'm going to start the section on the day that that connect to. Loving God, as they connect to following Christ. Any questions before we move on? Okay. I mean, in some ways, this long letter we summarize by saying, Christ is the answer. <laughs> you know, you know that? You got to be able to say. You follow Christ, you do the right thing, that's all you need to know. So, it's like many things, Christ is the answer. Paragraph 14. This certainly does not mean that Christ wishes us to put love of neighbor higher than, or set apart from love of God. This is evident from this conversation with the teacher of the law. I'm asking a question very much like what I asked of a young man. Jesus refers to the two commandments of the God and the neighbor. So remember, we said last time that traditionally the Ten Commandments are depicted as these two tablets. If you look at the Old Testament, it describes Moses having two tablets that God writes upon, the, the words of the law. And so these were traditionally were seen as. Um, Traditionally, we're seen as uh, the first three commandments dealing with God, and the next seven dealing with neighbor, tablet one, tablet two. Or, as Christ puts it, love, your, love God is of all things, love your neighbor as yourself for God's sake. Tablet one, tablet two. 
And our minds hinder only by observing these, both of these, to love God and love your neighbor. Again, just say, they love not to hate God, not to love my neighbor, but I'm going to love God and hate my neighbor. It don't work, it doesn't work. I see both. Only by observing both of them, you have eternal life. Do this and you will live. <clears throat> Nevertheless, the significance is precisely the second of these commandments. Through the curiosity of the teacher of the law, who asks him, Who is my name? The teacher replies, Christ replied, is the teacher, with the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is critical for fully understanding the commandment of love and neighbor. These two commandments, which depend on all the law and prophets, are found to connect and mutually related. They are inseparable even if he was tested to by Christ in his words and by his very life. The mission culminates in the cross of our redemption, the sign of the liberty love of the Father and the Amen. Both the Old Testaments explicitly affirm that the love of neighbor may concrete keep the commandments. They have a love for God is not possible. St. John makes this point extraordinary forcefulness. If anyone has I love God without and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, he has not sinned, he has sinned. Can't love God, he has not sinned. It as echoes the moral preaching of Christ who expressed in a wonderful and ambiguous way the parable of Samaria. And his words about the final judgment. That was hungry, he gave me 13 to break the church, he gave me There's a couple of things to break down. So on these things depend the law of the prophets. What does this phrase mean? So, for the, the Jewish peoples, um, basically what they're just saying is the entirety of the scriptures. The law meant the first five books of the law, the prophets based on Abraham. Um, sometimes you might have the law of the prophets of the writers. Um, but the law of the prophets basically is the entirety of the Old Testament. I'll follow these two commandments. Now, what's not being said which would often play this word of Christ, especially by some modern thinkers and speakers. It's what they'll say is, therefore, in all that matters is, do you love people? And by love, they mean his feelings. <laughs> right? I'll see that people will say, well, as long as you love, you, you can't sin. And so therefore, since I love, you know, my neighbor who's not my husband, my wife, I can run away with that and I'm going to not fill up the commandments. Well, that's not what's being said. Or, I know that I have, normally it tends to be stuff that's sexual, that's where I'm with the people who are in these shows. Um, I can contraset because, well, I'm being in love with my husband, or I'm in love with my wife. Or I can, you know, fill in the life. My girlfriend can defend love with her. Um, so what's not being said is that, what Christ is saying, is that, is that ultimately, he's not saying that nothing matters except um, how you feel toward people, and then morality doesn't matter. What he's saying is, in the end, everything that God does, everything that revelation happens in revelation, is to bring us back to a place where we have a good relationship with God. They can act like God and be with God and do what God does. Right? Because God Himself, is, God wants us to have a friendship with Himself. <laughs> and God, in His love for us, came and walked with us, died for us, and out of love for us, told us to not sin, do not steal, do not commit adultery, do not lie, do not don't lie. That's part of love. Right? Morality and love are opposites. The Ten Commandments are opposite of love, they're part of, the, of, of this love. They're part of how we love God. In a moral world, disconnected love from morality, love from truth, love from obeying God, love from living an upright life. 
you've separated that from heads from heads, then therefore you can take this forward. This is nothing to do with the Ten Commandments. And what Christ is saying is that all of these things, everything that he's doing, the dying on the cross, what's walking with us, my man, all of our relational testimony is to bring us back to a place that he created us for. To have this good relationship with God, this friendship with God, the sonship of God, and to live as God lives as a relationship with each other. Because when you love somebody, you're going to walk in the right way. Now, people will also then say that this is, you know, as long as you do this, it doesn't matter what you believe. Right? They'll say, well, well he's a good person, it doesn't matter that the day that he's a very an atheist. Because he's, he's nice to his neighbor, so he's there for it, doesn't matter, he doesn't believe in God. Well, no. believing in somebody, knowing who somebody is, is part of love. Right? And so this love is not divorced from your knowledge of who somebody is. This love is not divorced from the, the knowledge of the truth of who Christ is, who God is, of the way God has made us. And so what we believe and how we act are not separate, or are two sides of the same, but really the same thing. Because I believe in God, because I know He's the Creator, because I know who He is and what He's done for me, therefore I love and follow Him. Because I know God has done what He loves my neighbor, therefore I will love them as well. And so the creed, the dogmas, the theology is not separate from my choice. It's what I have moral theology. Right? This is a, there's a choice of right and wrong and what I believe, which leads me back toward God. And this is why Christ can say the law and the prophets depend upon these two commandments. Because Christ is trying to bring us back to a place where we learn and we were created with this automatically. There was an original sin, they were created with the friendship of God, they were created with love for each other, and then we proved it. But in all of our relations, God trying to bring us back to himself, rescue us from death, and bring us back to where we can be in heaven with him forever. God. I love for us, God created us to save us, and now we return us to love God and then love those who God loves and love the next God loves. That makes sense? And furthermore, these things are connected. The reason why I can't love God and hate my neighbor is first of all because, well, God told me to love him. Second, let's see at a human level. Think, think of your spouse, your children, or those who are dear to you. If I really hated them, I was hurt of them, could I be friends with you? No. I mean, you might have the enemies, this kind of depends on how much I've heard of them. Um, I probably would have them. <laughs> but, I mean, yeah, I mean, it doesn't make any sense. That if, if, if I don't love the people whom you love as well, I cannot love you. I can't you know, be beating up your children or trying to kill your spouse and then be your friend. And so how can I hate my neighbor and say, I love God. Another angle to look at it as is if loving God is to become like God, it is, and all this morality to basically doing the right and wrong is, is living as God lives. It's making my choices conform to the reality of our being as something God is. And if I hate my neighbor, I'm I being like God, who came and died for us and, and gave his life for us. No. Therefore, how can I truly be loving him and do what's asked of I can't. It doesn't work. So it's not that the same thing. They are different things. They're different people. But they're very closely connected. In order to love God fully, I must love my neighbor. And as we'll see also, in order to love my neighbor fully, I must love God. Because if I don't want heaven for them, I don't want eternal life for them, I'm not loving them. If all I want for them is that they're fat and happy here, but I can't feel what hell or not. I'm a loving. If 
lies the matter of me whether or not they burn in eternity or hell, how much we love you. In the same way, I can't say, you know, well, I really, really care about whether you're cool or not. I don't care if you're strong today. Well, I don't really care about you. If we don't love my neighbor for God, with God, pointing back toward God, I love my neighbor. If I don't love my neighbor, I can't love God, I can't love God, I can't love God, I can't love God. These are connected. They cannot be, they, they're different. They can't, can't toss out one and think you're okay. Good. In the Sermon on the Mount, the Magna Carta of the Gospel morality, what's the Magna Carta? Establishment of modern civilization and laws. But so, so when certain amount of people call the Magna say that foundation of the Gospel morality, but Jesus says, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law of the prophets. The Old Testament, the writings there, the, the, whole, the Jewish word of law. And if I'm to abolish them to fill them, perfect them, complete them, put them in the proper context that they need this close to me. Christ himself is the key of the scriptures. It's the understandable, it gives them the context and the meaning, their purpose. John chapter 5. He starts the scriptures to this day that bear witness to me. Christ, the center of the economy of salvation, the pathway, everything that God does for us is to bring us down. The recapitulation of the Old Testaments, everything in them is finds their center and their head in them. Of the promises and the law that fulfillment of the gospel. He is living in eternal in the Old Testament covenants. Commenting on the Paul said that the Christ is the end of the law, um, Ambrose says, and not in the sense of deficiency, but in the sense of the fullness of the law, the fullness which is achieved in Christ. With that attitude of the legis, peace to us. As he came up abolish the law of the in the same way, there's, there's an Old Testament, the Old Truth is in the New Testament. So this is for the law. What was given to Christ is a figure of the new true law. Was it the new truth? Moses is a figure of the true law, excuse me. Therefore, the Mosaic law is the image of the truth. Jesus brings God's commandments to fulfill, particularly the commandment of the love of neighbor, by interiorizing the demands of every child that pulls to meeting. Love of neighbor springs from a loving heart. Precisely because of love, it's ready to live out of love of these challenges. Jesus shows that man must not be understood as the minimum limit, not to be gone beyond, but rather as a path involved in all the spiritual journey toward perfection, part of which is love. Thus, the commandment that you shall not murder becomes a call to an attentive love that protects most of the life of one's neighbor. The precept of living adultery becomes invitation to a pure way of looking at others, capable of respect and spouse of meaning in the body. You've heard that it was said that better hold, you shall not kill, whoever kills you to life with judgment. But I say, therefore, there's anything with his brother shall be life with judgment. You've heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at his woman lustfully, the ready commit adultery with her in his heart. Jesus himself is the fulfillment of the law as much as he fills its ultimate meaning. That's what he gives to himself. He himself is the living of her personal law, which invites people to follow him. Through the Spirit, he gives the grace to share his own life and love, provides strength with his love of personal choices <coughs> and actions. The lot here is busy with prayers. That's how it breaks the Bible. <laughs> All too often, people will try to see the Ten Commandments or the other laws of the Gospel as a minimum, a checklist. How far can I go before I sin? How, how much do I have to love my neighbor? How far should I go before I can stop? At what point, how much can I look before I can look away? How angry is too angry? 
And what Christ is trying to show us here, the reason why they're in the fulfillment of the law, is because what Christ is trying to show us here is not about a minimum. It's not about a checklist. It's that imitation of God, living as God lives. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. We're trying to be followers of Christ. And Christ can say, no, hey, no, Father, Dad, how much do I have to suffer? Why can I stop? What's sufficient to save them? He just, he lived and loved and did what he was called to do. And loved until the end. And so when it comes to commandments, when it comes to these things, but Christ, it, 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 well, he might even, he fulfills them. And he's not saying, okay, you follow these five things, all of a sudden, it'll be perfect, I'm going to do it. What he's saying is, is these are a expression and a pathway to imitating God, the Son walking as, as God walks, the thing as God lives. And so it's not that you should not kill, well, as long as I don't actually kill somebody, you can beat them up. I'm good. <laughs> it's not that, okay, well, I didn't kill anybody, but therefore I'm fine. What Christ is saying is this is meant to be an expression of, do you care about people? It's not merely a matter of, I haven't killed anybody. It's where is my heart coming acting toward those around me? John Paul II says, this commandment is in a path not simply that if I, if I kill somebody, I have the people live. Am I a source of life those around me, help those around me, that is Christ's life? It's not simply, like, having gone stuff with my neighbor's wife. I'm good then. It's do I look at, at everyone around me when Christ looks at them? In love and in charity, not simply as objects. Or as body parts. Do I look at them as people? And treat them as people? Whoever they may be, including my spouse, especially my spouse. Um, and so Christ is the fill of the law in a couple of different ways. Christ fulfills the law, first of all, because he himself lives in a certain way. He's God. And he fills the law because he shows exactly what he's trying to say to us. When he gives us a piece of the time here with the living in his life, he is showing us what the law is. As he dies, he's life and he lives to the end. This is what it means to love our neighbor, to not kill, to not steal, to not cheat, to not lie. Lives Christ. But secondly, he fills the law because he gives, because by dying on the cross on his grace, and bring us to the heart of God by adding us to God's life, he gives us the way we can live and love and walk with God in a true way. Because walking with God, doing God's will, is not simply a matter of, I didn't kill somebody today, I didn't steal anybody anything today, therefore I'm perfect. What were we to do? It's my walking with the Son of God, living with God, I do so, this relationship I have with God. Mm-hmm. This relationship can get deeper, and any relationship can get deeper. And any relationship can get better. And if I seek and strive for that, I have a deep and authentic, real relationship with, with the person who I love is God, then treating those we love the way God, and the way He treats them. That's what I'm aiming for, I'm a challenge. So even though, yes, you have to articulate you know, certain things that are good for us, certain things that are wicked, certain things that are sin, are sins, because that's, we need that, it's where it is. That's not the goal. The goal is not simply not, to not sin, the goal is to be holy. The goal is to live as God lives. And by Christ the kind man walking with the dying on the cross, he himself is the grace, the means necessary to do that. I'm not doing this alone. It's not my, my own power, my own wisdom, not my own work. It's not doing it walking with Christ, living with Christ, being joined to Christ the sacraments and through love. And so Christ himself can be called the law. The new law of the gospel is Jesus. Not the thing of the person. And we see this in a couple of places as well. So for example, we see this the Jewish people, the Ten Commandments, those are the word commandments, those are the word, the word, the word, they use the word, the word law. So what they say, they say these are the ten, not the ten commandments. These are the ten what? 
Ten words. The New Testament, what does St. John, the people, St. Paul, but St. John especially, what does what St. John call Christ? The Word. So the one word. The unique word. In the beginning was the Word. Well, that's the law. He himself is this law of living, following, and imitating Christ. You become a man, lets us then live and act as God does. It's, again, it's, not, it's an astonishing thing. For Christ says, you're perfect as your father's perfect. Live as God lives. And because I became man, you now live as God. And it's an astonishing thing. It's a very beautiful thing. Other questions on that? There's a little bit there. Again, a lot in here, but it's not as much as it looks. But it's something you can see to chew on and pull apart for years. I have a question for Please. Um, when my children were very young, you know, elementary school, uh, uh, you say you love your neighbor. Well, we had neighbors that were so bad. Their kids were so bad, and I did not like them. I did not like the people because they were never any men their children. And one day the younger one, my son was having a matchbox. I was so angry. And, um, and then soon after that, my brother, who was uh, a year older than my daughter, I don't know what he did, but I, I know I was wrong about it. Uh, they had to, well, I felt they had to defend themselves. So I told my daughter, I said, well, just, he had long hair. I said, just grab his hair in the back and just swing your swing him around until he cries. Then he won't lie. <laughs> and now that I think about it, you know, I don't like my neighbors. What do you do? I mean, it happened a long time ago. <laughs> Yeah, probably. Uh, so a couple of things that I would say. <laughs> so what is love? And how do you love the people who don't love you? Tolerate them without doing them harm. <laughs> is that my sense? I don't know. Twisting the best of them. Yeah, that's right. Or a little tree. That's right. That's right. Some people that, that you know, some people are just very harmful and toxic. I don't think they're asking us to expose ourselves to, to danger or harm, but uh, we pray for them. The modern definition of love doesn't cover it. Sometimes it hurts. What does it mean with a lover? The yeah. definition of love. <laughs> yeah. So, love is good for them, but that's not work. It's not wishful thinking. Like, love, love or enemy doesn't, doesn't mean to be given the chance to hurt us, necessarily, especially where we're hurt, sure. Um, especially when we're in a position of a place we have to protect ourselves. But that doesn't mean love them after, only after they've repented, only after they've repented. It means love them now. Is what was good best for them, what was good for them. And so there may be times we have to defend ourselves with those in our care. I mean, but we do so even when we're defending ourselves, that's still what's best for them. If somebody is being wicked, what's best for them is they're caught in prison. That's good for them to be they can change their ways. Now, now if someone wants them to be hurt because I'm mad at them and wants them to be hurt by I'm hurting, that's not loving my name. But to love my, my enemy is to what was best for them, even those who don't love me, those who are okay, we're wanting to be bad for them. That's loving as God loves. He came and he came and died for us, not because we're so good and we're loving him, we're hurting him, we need to be killed. So to love like God loves means to love even our enemies, to love those who, who hate us or harm us. But love is, doesn't mean emotional attachment to them, but it means to want to work for their good. That's the point of the Good Samaritan. See, 
Of course, we're used to hear with the Good Samaritan. We think all Samaritans are good. That's not what the story means. The Jews and Samaritans were bitter, were bitter enemies. They were bitter enemies. I mean, this would I mean, it, it probably in today's days, days, days the four people today, Christ probably tell the story of a good Palestinian. You know, it, it, that's how bitter the rivalry was. I mean, they hated each other. Because the fact that, that this man's enemy is going to come into the as enemy, beaten up and hurt, he goes to the only is going to take care of him. He's going to work for him, he's going to pay money for him, he's going to, he's going to give him up his own self, and do stuff that his own people would not do for him. That's why he's an example of, of love. It's not only that, that these were great friends, not all that they would be good to each other. These were enemies. These were people who hated each other. That's what, the, that's what this parable means, is, you know, who, who took care, who took care of, of a man on the way to, 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 to Jericho? It was not the priest, it wasn't, it wasn't the Levite, it wasn't, it was the enemy. So who is your neighbor? It's anyone around you, you tell. Anyone who needs love, which is everybody. Who doesn't need that? Who doesn't need love? Who doesn't need to be cared for? There's not one person in the room who doesn't need someone. And so, yes, it's easier to love people when he loves back. But that's not the limit. It's not loving this thing. Because how does God love? Does God say, well, I will love you as long as you love me? No. But always loves. That's why I died on the cross. It's in order to walk as God walks, to love as God loves, to do as God does, to love our neighbor, to this commandment. We have to love even our enemies. We have to love even those who hate us. That's the whole point of, of salvation, is God is coming to his enemies and trying to redeem them. God made and pleads with us to come back. God tries to save us. In order to walk as God walks, to do as God does, I must have his imagination, the same heart, the same desire, or I'm not living as his son. By walking as his daughter. If I draw boxes around and I say, well, those people can go to hell. I don't care about that. But these people are my friends. I am not living as bad as Christ lived. And it's hard. That's a, that's a, that's a hard ask. And so that's a hard request. Um, I'm, we're reading some of the stories about the, uh, the missionaries. There's a, the the, the, the Jesuits over in New England. Uh, when I first began preaching, the uh, some of the Indian encounters were good, but the but not all of them. Some of them remained vague for a long time. And so some of them were peaceful tribes. They heard they heard they had a lot of their Iroquois neighbors who were scalped to them, stealing from them, and robbing from them. And they're like, wait a minute, if they're going to be in heaven too, I don't want that to go there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Because their dream of heaven was they'd be safe from all these people. They were murderous SOBs, and then they were. But they had to be told, no, you have to love even them as Christ loved. You have to walk with them, you have to desire their salvation. <coughs> now, God's saying you go to them and say, oh, you're going to get stabbed, you're going to be a big Not saying that. But to work for them, desire their good, and want what's best for them as well. Can I defend myself? Yes. Can I protect my children? Yes. Must that I should. Don't protect my children from not being a good parent. Um, whether I defend myself to the kind of situation. Do I have responsibilities? Do I, but that's a whole different discussion. Um, but there are times when it may be necessary to defend myself, even in the hope somebody gets hurt. <clears throat> there should be my first response, or should be my desire. My desire should be the pain of my enemy. Does that make sense? Okay. No questions or comments? Right. Paragraph 16. We're going to go on the story of the rich young man. This is a reflection on the words of which he heard. So. The answer he receives about the commandments does not satisfy the young man, the answer is a question. 
I have kept all these things. What do I still like? So I have kept the commandments and done all the right things, but more than me. It is not easy to say with a clear conscience, I have kept all these. Otherwise, any understanding of the real meaning of the demands of painting God's law. Yet even though he has able to make this reply, even though he has followed the moral ideal seriously and generously and charitable, the rich young man knows he's still far from the goal. For the person who is, he realizes he's still absent. This is awareness of his morning of the deficiency that Jesus addressed as his final answer. Conscious of the young, of the young man's learning to become greater, which was in set of realistic interpretation of commandments. The good teacher, God himself, invites sinners to enter upon a path of perfection. This should be perfect to go to possessions and give money to the poor, for the treasure of heaven and come follow me. But the desire of our hearts is to love God and to love and to be one. It's the fact that we're living the right way, all we're thinking of is a checklist. We're going to be empty. The young man was doing a good job. He was obeying the commandments. But he wanted more because he wanted deep down to simply you know, pat the back and do a good job to get the commandments. He wanted a deep relationship with God. He wanted a deep union with God himself. As an earlier part of Jesus' answer, this too must be right interpreted in the context of the whole message of the gospel. In particular, the message of the Sermon on the Mount, the, the Beatitudes. The first of which is precisely the Beatitude of the poor, is the poor in spirit, as Matthew makes it here in the home. In this sense, it can be said the Beatitudes are also relevant to the answer that given by Jesus, the young man's question. But the message did have eternal life. Indeed, each of the Beatitudes promises, in particular viewpoint, the very good opens to man eternal life. Indeed, it is eternal life. The Beatitudes are not specifically concerned with certain particular rules of behavior. They are not a checklist. Don't do this, do that, don't do this. Rather, it's like a basic attitude and dispositions of life, and therefore, you are, and this one's not exactly what matters. On the other hand, there's also an opposition or separation between the Beatitudes and the Commandments, both referring to the good news of the Bible. The Sermon on the Mount begins with the proclamation of the Beatitudes, but also refers to the Commandments. At the same time, the Sermon on the Mount demonstrates the openness of the Commandments and the orientation toward the horizon of perfection of the Beatitudes. The latter are above all promises. Which there also is indirectly for normative and decay to the moral life. In the originality and profundity, there also is for itself for the Christ. And this very invitation, reason of invitations, the discipleship, the communion of life with Christ. The Ten Commandments are rules of behavior. You would think of them like a, a safety rank. Don't go beyond this. That's not enough, you have to live other ways. But they are safe to growl, you know, don't jump over the cliff. If you keep beyond the safety rail, you'll be okay. The Beatitudes say this is how you're supposed to live and love and look toward things. Beatitudes, what they really are, is they're answering false ideas of happiness. Right? Because they add happiness is only found where? God and heaven. And so, where did God look for happiness? Food, drink, pleasure, ourselves, glory, kind of. And so, what Christ, again, what Christ is saying is each of you yearn for happiness. Each of you want to be happy. Each of you want to be perfect. Each of you will long for happiness. And all of us do. All of us have a longing deep down for, for truth, for goodness, for more. The Beatitudes are addressing the false ideas of happiness and are correcting But it's not that blessed are those who are wealthy. Blessed are those who are 
have riches and power and all these things, but those who are poor in spirit. In other words, who aren't slaves to these things, but who use them in the proper way and who are looking toward God. Now, the young man's problem is he's attached to his goods. He's sad he has to give up his estate. He likes being a rich young man. In the Jewish culture, being wealthy not only to come with you know, was he didn't live to live, but also was a very as a social status. And also, there was a, a kind of this idea that if you are blessed by God, you will live in the right way. If you are poor, you're probably not living the right way. So the rich young man, by giving up his wealth, not only giving up money, material comfort, he's giving up people looking at him in the He's giving up praise. He's giving up this kind of admiration of going, you're, you're awesome, you're great. I want to be just like you and I love. Yeah, kind of. That's what he's been doing. Because at this point, he's attached to that. That's where he's finding his happiness. That's why he's empty. So what Christ is saying to him is like, go of those things that are keeping you slaves. Like, go of those things that are keeping you from, from following God perfectly, and then you will be happy, you will let it turn along. And deep down, he knows this. And he struggles with that. But all of these things, then, is Christ showing us how to be happy, to, to be poor in spirit, to be meek. To be his attitudes, really what they are, he says, is their revelation of Christ and God, the portrait of who Christ is. On our wall in the church, each wall has 33 crosses. Why 33? Uh, Most of the crosses, if you look at them and compare them, are the same cross as our own tower. Um, the liver connection there takes Christ on. The one, there's one cross that that's that is different. Do you notice that? Yes. It's eight, eight pointed size. Mm -hmm. Why eight points do you think? The Beatitudes. The Beatitudes. So the center, the heart of Christ's life are the Beatitudes. So that's very limited what we have them there on that wall. So the, so the heart of Christ, center of Christ's life, as he lived all 33 years, where the Beatitudes, because they are actually showing who Christ is, how Christ dealt with people, how Christ looked for and dealt with God, name. Um, he, he was, he, he was the first to for righteousness, did suffer for truth. He, he was attached to the goods of this, this, this world, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Number 17. We do not know how clear the young man in the gospel understood the profound and challenging quote Jesus' first reply. He was for the life of the commandments. But it's certain the young man's commitment to respect all the moral demands of the commandments presents essential ground in which the desire of perfection can take root of sure. The desire that is for the meaning of the man is to completely fulfill the call of Christ. If you're not going to follow the basic morality, you're not going to fulfill Christ. No, if you're in reading as a greedy, grasping, murder person, you're not going to follow Christ at all. Jesus' conversation with the young man helps us to grasp the conditions of the moral growth of the human being, the man, the call of perfection. The young man had observed the commandments, so he's incapable of taking the next step by himself alone. To do so requires a return human freedom, to be perfect, and God's of the grace. Come follow me. Without Christ, I cannot, I cannot no kill you. Even there, though, deep down, I believe that's help. At least sometimes. Because in the end, you can do anything without God's help. But that's not sufficient to truly be a disciple of Christ, for that and the grace of God. Perfection demands that this maturity and self giving, but human freedom is called. And we're free of this for the sake of self freedom, for the sake of being able to live as Christ lived, to walk as Christ walked. Freedom is not for the sake of doing what I want. That's not freedom because where's it going to lead me? Won't lead me toward what's best and what's good for me, what's true. I'm only doing what I feel at the moment. I'm a slave to my feelings, to my desires. 
which mean I'm a slave to these things which make me desirable. Perfection demands maturity of self-giving to a freedom is called. Jesus points out to the young man that the matters are the first indispensable condition for having eternal life. On the other hand, the young man gives all his possessions and to follow him, but as an invitation if you wish. These words of Jesus reveal the particular dynamic of freedom's growth and maturity. At the same time, they bear witness to the fundamental relationship between freedom and the divine law. Human freedom and God's are not in opposition. Like something that, again, is something we struggle with, as we always tell us. I'm, I'm free, therefore I can do what I want. But to, if I follow the commands of God, I'm not free anymore. Although follow the commands of God makes me free. So I'm not slaves to food or pleasure or drink or, or my own limbs. Human freedom and God's law are provisioned into each other on the contrary they appeal to the other. The follower of Christ knows his vocation is to freedom. And Paul says he recalls freedom knowledge. He claims to be with joy and pride. He adds, only not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love be servants of God. The firmness in which the apostle opposes those who believe they are justified by the law has nothing to do with man's liberation from precepts, from laws, not free from laws. On the contrary, these laws are the service of the practice of love. For he who loves his neighbor is the fulfillment of law. Commands who shun not the adultery, shall not murder, shall not steal, shall not covet, and that way commandments are summed up in the sentence, shall love your neighbor as yourself. I should find a few guys, I probably would probably be helpful. Some of the stuff people were using is claiming they, you know, when they will use this scripture, twist them will say that for Christians there's no, no more commandments. And therefore, you know, when someone says to me, you know, maybe you need to you know, stay married to your spouse, you need to not become contraception, you need to, well, they, they're following the old law. They're, they're, they're being trapped by the commandments, being trapped by the precepts. I should, I should, people would say that. So John Paul II is challenging them directly. This is a direct challenge to people who are trying to claim that. I should, I should find some um, quotes like that. I mean, you can see this. Yes, but what he's saying, you know, it, it is nice, it's true, but it makes a lot more sense when you realize that what he said, this is, he's answering a challenge. He's answering a very twisted way of looking at freedom and love. It sounds good. Right? It, it can be confusing when you first hear, well, you don't want to be a slave, do you? The old law, when they were trapped you know, by the law, that's when they did this, but you are free in Christ. And therefore, when someone says, you have to do these things, you are free to do the other things. Right? It sounds good. It sounded, it sounded attractive for people who follow us, who are confused about this, especially told by, by someone you trust. And so when John was like answering this, he's saying, no, you know, you have to look at this and look at these things. Law and freedom are opposites. Freedom has a purpose. And so when people try to claim, because I'm free in Christ, therefore, I don't have to follow the commandments. I've been baptized. I'm a follower of Christ. That's the only way to You don't want to understand my growth, my human freedom, do you? People will talk about that. People will write, write the very fancy books with fancy degrees, fancy titles, saying these things. And it looks very good. Because get deep down, a lot of us are not one of them anyway. Right? And now we have an excuse for doing sin. Because, well, Professor so and so, Father so and so, Bishop so and so said it was okay. This is why the Pope is actually. Also, if I remember next time, I'll we'll pull some of these quotes to show you what John Paul II was talking about. So, Augustine, after speaking of the observance of the commandments, to being a kind of incipient of freedom, was on to say, once in the last, it's not yet perfect. And the answer is because a senior member is not a law or a law by reason. But it, yes, all the commandments. Leads toward freedom, 
But the results for me, you know, I don't, I, I, you made don't, don't kill you know, my neighbor Jim, but boy, I feel like it. Maybe I don't want to go stealing or whatever, but sometimes I really wish I could. Maybe I don't go and, you know, you know attach for some money, but you know, maybe I'm not quite as detached as I should be. There is this war inside. There's this desire to do bad things sometimes, and all the time. So in part freedom, part slavery. I get complete freedom, I get pure and whole. It's not yet eternity, not in heaven. In part now we attain our freedom, and in part we have a problem with our weakness. All of our sins were destroyed in baptism. They've been forgiven, they're right away, they're gone. But it does not yet follow the weakness remain after our iniquity was destroyed. Had that no weakness remained, we would have no one lived up to sin in this life. But who would dare to say this? I have not sinned, I am perfect now. I don't need to have self anymore. Because that self is proud and worthy of the mercy of our deliverer. Therefore, because this has remained in us, I dare to say to the extent that we serve God, we are free. But to the extent that we serve the law of sin, we are still slaves. And so that's our answer to this claim of, of these people already. And that we say, well, I'm truly free, and therefore I, I, can, I can be good adultery and still love and be free. That's freedom. That's what's saying, no, that's slavery. Because you're not following God. Only God is our, our fulfillment, God is our happiness, God is what we're called to be. And this is from God, so it's going to lead us toward hell, toward slavery, toward being threatened. And so if you're sinning, you're not free. Number eight. Those who live by the flesh will experience God's laws of birth. Indeed, as they deny them themselves, as least restrict them their own freedom. If my goal, if my desire, if everything I need me is saying, I'm going to live toward money, toward power, or pleasure, toward these things. Yes, God's law will stop that. It'll feel, ouch. That's hard. Because I want to do all these other things. So if my goal, if my heart is attached to, to sin, God's law will oppose that. It'll be hard, it'll be hurt. But on the other hand, those who are impelled by love and the walk of the Spirit, who desire to serve others will find in God's law the fundamental and necessary way which to practice love is something for the chosen and freely lived out. If we live in the right way, then we'll find these things helpful because they'll show us how. They'll give us a direction. So this is how you are told to live and walk and to do these things. Because love is very abstract. I say it'll be good. What's that mean? This is just an answer. Indeed, they feel that you are a a necessity, a longer a form of coercion, not to stop them in the demands of the law, but to live them in their fullness. This is still uncertain in the fact that journeys longer from earth, there's still a chance to sin and temptation, as one made possible by grace, to enable us to possess the full, the full freedom of the system of God, and thus to live our moral life, the choice we make, the way we walk with them in this life, or in our vocation. Our survival vocation of sons in the sun. This vocation to perfect love is not restricted to a small group of individuals. The invitation go as the possessions and you mind the poor. And the promise you will have treasure in heaven meant for everyone. Because they bring out the full, the full meaning of the commandment of love and neighbor. Just the invitation which follows to follow me is the new specific form of the commandment of love and God. Both these commandments and these invitation to the rich young man stand at the service of the single indivisible charity, which tends toward that perfection is measured as God's law. You therefore say, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And the Gospel of Luke just makes the clear of the meaning of perfection. Be merciful, even as your heavenly Father is merciful. If we're living the right way, for walking as our wants to walk, there will be an urge in us to be close to them. And there will be a pain in us anytime we recognize we're, we're distant from. 
If we're not living the right way, then we're going to feel relief when we're away from them. I'll live life to my I'll say to ourselves, what's the least I can do to make God happy? Just not that. How do I avoid that? And God being merciful and good, it's time to satisfy with them. But we should. <laughs> right? That's what the confession or the, the minimum of sorrow that they have is you want to go to hell. When it comes to the sacrament, that's why he gave us that. But that shouldn't be enough for me. I'm called more. I should love God enough, right? But when I avoid these things, not simply that I don't want to go to hell and then be hurt, but because I love this, this person who loves me. And of love for him, then love my neighbor and do all of it. That's what I meant for that. Stop, I love twice today, I'm done, I'm good for the day. It's over. Well, I want to keep loving my neighbor, I want to keep loving those around me, keep doing that. And sometimes it's going to be hard. You know, you get a phone call in the middle of the night, you get down to dinner, and someone wants something, somebody wants something from you. Know, you just give them a note, tell them. You know, they always feel like you never do the other and that's where you have to you'll be saying, how I love things is Christ's love. There's something in that needs to be freedom. It's perfecting that needs to walk in the right way. Or detach myself from my plans, from my goals, from myself, and follow God and love my name. This is how you will walk. And going back then, you'll get to those people who would say that if I'm truly free and truly a Christian, I, I can at certain times put adultery or contracept or fill in the blank. What John Paul II is saying is saying, no, that's impossible. It makes no sense. It contradicts the scripture at every turn. Because we're not called in this minimum challenge. We're not called to in certain circumstances to do a good thing. We're called to live to do his cross. That's the measure. That's the call we have. That's the perfection we're expected to have. That makes sense? In some ways, it's that very basic, in some ways, very simple. But in some ways, very complicated. Especially if you look real life. You know, it's nice in the abstract, it's, it's nice in the piece of paper. When it comes to doing it, that can be hard. But questions, comments? Can't be stuck between freedom and license. You know, I totally. That's where that's where they get mom. Well, I'm free. I don't have a license to kill. I don't have a license to do anything I want. It's not freedom. No. <laughs> well, and I think also people like finding excuses. <laughs> you know, I'm the one who makes Well, it's actually hard not to apologize. You're fighting with each other. Because the two things are so close. Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know what you mean. You want to let go of it. Yes. No, it's, it's, it, it, it is. At the same time, the hardest thing, also the easiest thing. Yeah. Depending on how you look at it. Because hell's hard. But to, to follow that, it absolutely is the worst fall. It's easy to say. It's hard not to say. Absolutely. You know, at, when I was younger, I used to think that posture is simply that it matters. You know, that, you know, so if you're at home by yourself, who cares what you do when you're in the house? by yourself. And so I know my posture. No one told me it was about, you know, not preserving your back. <laughs> I thought it was matters. And darn it, now I wish I knew what it was for. No, it was not easy at the time to ignore my posture. But it's real hard now. <laughs> In a similar way. All of those things which were hard at first, you're training them to practice that and they don't have this. They're real hard at first. But in the long run, the better way, the easier way, it's not to follow that way, it's to okay. Good. Let's end there then, and we'll pick up with number 19 uh, next week. Um, yeah,
Let's close the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we entrust this time to you in this conversation. We thank you for your goodness for us and for showing us the way. Give us the grace and the strength to follow you in all things, and be perfect as you are. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it shall be, for all the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Thank you.